<clears throat> okay, so we are recording now. Thank you. All right, should we jump into the video? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. So for anybody who hadn't seen that yet, I thought this was an incredible video that was created by one of the Rotary Clubs that participated in the Ridge to Reef cleanup on Rotarians at Workday from our friends over at South Kilo. Is there anybody on the call from there today? I'm looking at the participants, but I'm not 100% certain. Um, they, they did such an incredible job with that video and they just really understood exactly, you know, what we were going for, what we're trying to, um, the, the mission we're trying to serve and the, and the vision that we had for this project. So 
to um, kind of introduce myself. My name is April Bolas, and I'm part of the Eco Rotary Club of Kaka'ako. I'm one of the um, founding members, one of the uh, charter members, per se. And um, I've been a happy member of the club for a couple of years now. And um, with the environment being added as an area of focus to Rotary International, um, our Eco Rotary Club was really excited at the challenge to step up and to do and create projects that not only for us, but that hopefully we could take to the District 5000 level. Um, and one of those projects started out with our tree planting project that we did on Rotary Gives Thanks in November. Uh, many, many different members from multiple Rotary clubs here on Oahu participated in that. And we also had clubs on Maui that did some fruit tree planting um, on that day as well. So it was on that day that I had a conversation with Naomi and Peely, our Eco Rotary Club president, and said, um, you know, I had an idea for something that we could do in the month of April during Rotarians at Work Day, which is on a Saturday following. Whoop, sorry, I'm getting some static feedback. Is everybody's phones or mics muted? There we go. Um, so I had this conversation with Peely and Naomi that I had an idea to uh, take advantage of Earth Day, which is every day for us eco warriors here, and to create a project called Ridge to Reef. And the idea with this project is that just as much above as it is below, there is trash from the depths of the deepest oceans to space, as we were just talking about a little earlier. Um, our, our human fingerprint is essentially trash, and we want to find ways to eliminate that problem, but also create some solutions and some rotary projects along the way. Um, so my hope was to, to take this project to the District 5000 level and to not only do the beach cleanups, which is something a lot of us are really familiar with, but really focus on the data collection component of that as well. Um, without the data, we're just speculating. We might have a guesstimation. We might be curious and have a thought of what the problems might be, but um, from the clubs that we were able to collect data from, I think you'll be really interested to uh, see what kind of data those clubs were able to share with us. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna try to um, share my screen and show you guys a, a little presentation. It says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Make sure the co host do. Yep. Okay. Is your iPhone, April? Is my co host? Uh, the iPhone yeah. will be my audio, and then my okay. um, computer is going to be the screen that okay, I'll share the slides it. on. Yeah. Sorry for the confusion. No, it's all good. I used to do that too. <laughs> okay uh okay are you good all right i think so all right oh. I don't, here we go let's try this again is it sharing yeah can you guys see okay great and then let me come up here and i'll just push the play button nope come on yeah, go to go to slide and choose start from number beginning. That's um, my beginning slide. I'm just trying to play it and hmm. Try view. Try the view window. View option. Present. That will work. There you, there you go. Thank you so much. Thank you for our tech support on the line. You've been so helpful this whole time. Thank you. Thank you so so much. Okay, now it says it's loading. Here we are, our Rich to Reef cleanup and data collection. Um, so this was the graphic that was, um, you know, designed by a wonderful local artist that John had reached out to. And again, this, you know, it doesn't go without saying, and I'll probably repeat it again and again, it takes a multiple people's effort to get this to happen. An idea, like I had this little idea to do this project, but the idea is worth nothing if people don't implement it and come together and actually take action. So I just wanted to thank Megan for creating that beautiful graphic um, that we were all able to use to kind of promote and get some excitement around our event that really emphasizes the ridge, the beautiful ridge line in the background and the reef, including the state fish, the uh, 
well, I'm going to pronounce this hopefully correctly. Humu humu nuku nuku apuwa'a. And I just think she did a wonderful job with that. This was another flyer that was created for part of the reef cleanup. Um, I just really want to thank um, Dave Livingston for reaching out and helping to set up the Ocean Defenders Alliance reef cleanup portion of our cleanup. Um, so many of you are familiar with images like these, um, seeing our wildlife and animals being trapped by man-made products. Um, fishing nets are, and derelict fishing nets are becoming a bigger and bigger problem, and it seems to be ongoing and never ending. Um, this is no habitat for our wildlife. We would never treat our, you know, household dog or cat this way. So we shouldn't expect our animals and their furry and fishy friends in the wildlife to have to live this way. Um, so this is actually this photo right here is um, a reef off of Mokalaiia, which is one of the cleanup locations. So this picture was taken and you can see this is not in deep water. This is pretty shallow water. And unfortunately, this does seem to be a, a reoccurring theme throughout many of the islands. Um, so this cleanup was uh, at the Pearl Harbor Historic Trail. This, this project right here was really headed up by our uh, two Eco Rotary Club members, well technically three, um, Christina, Lori, and Katie. So these girls came together, they partnered with the city and county of Honolulu, they partnered with uh, um, Clean Water, the Clean Water Heroes, and they got together over 300 volunteers on this day. They cleaned up tons of material, including some abandoned cars. And really, again, it does take so many hands on deck to make a big project like that come together. There was a lot to clean up and I have a feeling um, that's gonna be an ongoing project that we will return to. Um, and you know, it's a beautiful historic spot. It, it's really important to have our outdoor spaces cleaned up um, especially during COVID-19 where, you know, we need the fresh air and you were cooped up inside so much, but it's an actually a safe place to socially distance. So as you can see there, there's so many individuals that put a lot of hard work into that really big cleanup. Um, this is another cleanup at Centennial Park. We had a couple Eco Rotary members join over there. I believe Peter Evans and Pili Valderrama joined up with the folks over there. To just show some support, I tried to make sure that I had an Eco Club member at as many of the locations throughout the island just to show up support and to um, help and see how it goes and see the different issues that are affecting each one of these areas. Um, this is part of the cleanup that happened at Ala Moana slash Magic Island. And this device right here was donated to us to help separate the microplastics, which is another tremendous problem on all of the beaches that we're seeing, especially on those um, northeast facing, facing coastlines. But as you might know, this is a, a south beach um, and we're seeing microplastics accumulate there as well. Um, this is in- April, April, sorry. Was that the Farrington um, Junior Razzi? I think that is, I'm trying to, I don't know if I can zoom in on one of their shirts but it does kind of look like. Because they weren't with us, <laughs> by the way. They, I'm sorry? They weren't part of our group. Oh, that, that was our device. So they must have been working with our group to do that cleanup. I see the um, grain bags donated from Waikiki Brewing and that was our sense if they're on that day. It was one of these photos was submitted by um, a Rotary Club member. So maybe they were just a, uh, happy to join us and help support our cleanup. <laughs> okay. April, could you tell me how that device works, please? Absolutely. So on the higher end of that device, uh, it's actually just chicken wire and three old bicycle rims uh, zip tied together. And basically what you would do is you would shovel or bucket the sand into that higher elevation level where it's open and you could get the sand inside. At the bottom where that young man is kneeling down, there's a rotation handle on there and it actually cranks that device around and it spins out the sand, keeping the debris inside and that little blue, um, it's a, actually, I believe it's a peanut butter cup cap. <laughs> That's where you would um, empty out the, the, the bits at the end and try to separate from there um, the organic matter versus the inorganic matter but it is a huge time saver. If any of you folks are familiar with the hand sifting devices, this can sift through a tremendous amount of sand in a short period of time. 
it's not perfect, but it's, it's a far more efficient option than to have a hand sifter. Um, and yeah, the gentleman that created that, he also donated some hand sifting devices to us as well, which was really helpful, both metal sifters and he made some wooden, wooden frame sifters as well. Thank you. And is is the outside of that, that cylinder, is that a clear plastic cylinder of some kind? Or is it a sheet that's been ro rolled into a circle or, or what? That's just um, some wire mesh. So it's like chicken wire. It's and that wire. Allows... I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I wish I could zoom in on these photos to give you a better, better view in there. Um, but it's a pretty large device. And actually, it's one of the smaller ones that I've seen in use. But um, it just barely fits in my car, so big enough. And there were, it's an even bigger device at the Waimanalo Beach cleanup here on Oahu that same day that was probably two to three times that size. So you can really just, as fast as you shovel sand in, somebody's cranking the wheel around, spins the sand out, keeps the plastic and particles inside. Pretty neat, pretty neat Thank technology. You. Of course. And yeah, anybody, any questions as I'm going, I have a habit of talking fast and moving forward. If you have any questions or comments, please interject. Um, this is another beach cleanup. I believe this was on uh, Kauai. So, you know, we're off in rural tra trails. This was not, you know, they're a little off the beaten path to get to. So I just want to emphasize how much work it really took everybody to get to these locations. Um, this was uh, a photo taken at the Surfrider Foundation Waimanalo cleanup in partnership with our Rotary Club. They had hundreds of volunteers come out. They removed tons of materials. And I'll go over the data that they collected um, from their cleanup, um, which we helped support that day as well, because it, it's, it's pretty astounding what we can all do when we come together for just a couple hours, just a couple hours on one day. Um, this is a really cool picture of Steve. I'm not sure if he's on the call right now, um, but we didn't, <laughs> he didn't um, take the easy way out. If he saw a piece of rubbish, he went down and he got those hard to reach um, reef, or hard to reach um, plastic and net debris. Here's another really great picture that uh, it's unfortunate, but we're seeing so many ropes and nets washing up on our shorelines. Um, this one was manageable you know, to pick up by one person, but sometimes they get so big that we're having to chainsaw them into smaller bits to get them out of the locations, especially those rural remote areas where you have to, you know, drive and then hike into as well. Um, this is such a beautiful picture from the Honolulu Sunset Rotary Club. So I believe that is um, the groups that were with us down there at um, Magic Island and the Ala Moana cleanup, which they're so close to one another. So I apologize if I'm grouping them in together, but they're in such close proximity. Um, but as you see, we had a really great strong show of support and that was their morning shift. They did two shifts, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So really, really thankful to um, Lisa and Ari over there that helped set that up. This is from James Campbell National Wildlife Refuge. As you can see, there's a, a limited number of individuals that was allowed there. Um, we were the first group that was allowed back to this location since COVID. And it was kind of like a pilot test program to see if we could do something like this safely. Uh, I'm happy to say that they had a tremendous day. They were really successful. And I mean, the pile of nets that you see on the outside compared to what's inside of that rubbish container. Uh, thank you to Dick May for helping set that up. And uh, one of our Eco Rotary members, Talon, that went up to that location to do uh, this cleanup and you can see in there there's two um, individuals from um, the parks department and the one gentleman I believe he said he came down from Alaska to help um, get this program off the ground and get permission to make this happen so really really thankful um, and a, a Rotaract member as well that also helped to join this day so um, Luke is in there and he brought some some friends up too and they had a really really successful day so I can't wait to get back up there to James Campbell. Um, this is uh, just to highlight the reef cleanup which is you know something that we were able to do at one location. I'm hopeful to expand this project into doing multiple locations on the same day if not multiple cleanups throughout the year. So Ocean Defenders Alliance um, was really helpful in making this partnership happen, making sure that we got um, you know, training and we were able to remove the rubbish from the reef 
safely. We don't want to damage the reef by getting rid of humans trash. Um, so I just really um, appreciative to them and what a great partnership that I plan to continue into the future. Um, for those who didn't get to see, um, we were all over the news for this cleanup. And as you can see there, they brought a mattress out of the water. There were four tires and just multi, just so much debris, pillows and plastic you know, bottles. And it, it was a really um, impressive cleanup because so many folks were coming up. And this was the case at multiple locations saying, oh, there wasn't a lot to clean up. There wasn't very much. I only found a little, but everybody found a little and that little adds up to a lot. Um, so thank you to everybody that was able to post on their social media during this day too. I am confident that us Rotarians getting out there with our logoed hats, shirts, visors, and those Rotarians at Workday, um, high visibility vests too, really made people ask, you know, what are you guys doing? And who are you with? And what is Rotary? So I'm really excited to see that. And um, even the, the, you know, their president was getting down and dirty to clean up. So the next step of this Ridge to Reef cleanup and data collection is really how do we process this data in a meaningful way? And how do we separate it? And how do we classify it? Um, in the data collection meeting that we had prior to the actual cleanup and data collection day, we discussed multiple different options of ways to record it, organizations that might find this information helpful, including Sustainable Coastline, Surf Rider Foundation, uh, Ocean Conservatory, um, and NOAA, just to name a few. But what I decided to do for this project for our first time is to create just like the top 10 items that we might find at locations, you know, we could have included masks and disposable gloves and, you know, the, the list of items that can be found on our beaches, trails and parks are, are endless essentially, but I just wanted to narrow it down to a couple and this, this bucket really shows what's common, you know, food wrappers, bottles and cans, utensils and cigarette butts. So this is just a, um, a small picture of what was being sorted and separated out at the Mokalaia beach cleanup here on the North shore. And again, that was another one where was, everybody found just a little bit, but when we piled it up on the tarp, um, the pile at the end of the day was quite substantial. Um, so this is just a little diagram that kind of helped for folks that got really into it, how to classify the data and foam and the fragments and the, the sheets of foil paper and, you know, how big is microplastic? How big is a macroplastic? And I like to say, um, you've probably heard it before that microplastics are an inconvenient thing that have macro problems. I mean, this is invading every aspect of our lives from our food chains to the safety of our, of our ourselves, you know, our food, our eating these, you know, microplastics, because they think they're eggs or, you know, fish eggs, it's, it's, un, it's really unfortunate, but this diagram really helps kind of how we categorize um, the plastics and the microplastics. So this is a, a more up close picture of those hand sand sifters. And what's kind of painful staking process with this is it, it doesn't sift out the organic material, right? So the leaves, the twigs and the branches that come in there, there's not a really great way to sift those out um, other than doing it by hand until we met um, Ray at Seed World. So this is a buoyancy separation device. So what this does is you can pour sand into there and the water rinses over the sand and it's gonna float those items to the top. And then what he does from there is he can take those items that float to the top and he puts them into essentially a pressure cooker, a pressurized chamber, which infuses the water into the organic matter and it causes the organic matter to sink, but the plastic, because it doesn't absorb, floats to the top. So this is a really cool way to separate microplastics to like a nano level beyond the thickness of a hair. It's, it's so small that you would not see it with your eye and it's kind of scary, but when he really gets done with the final sifting and sorting of this, it looks just like sand. It looks just like sand, but it's really plastic. Um, I wish I had a good picture of that, but I, I welcome you all. Um, he was at the Waimanalo Beach cleanup and he had an information booth over there to seek out and learn from these individuals. So again, this, this partnership 
with all these different organizations really made this day come together and we all learned so much along the way. Is there any, April, is there any chance that you could share his email or something with us so we could get the details on his process? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I'll share um, his information in the chat once um, we get into questions. Do we have a we have the recorded meeting where uh, he spoke with us? I'm not sure if that meeting was recorded, but he, he was a guest presenter. I believe it was just for the Eco Rotary Club, maybe not the SRAG Club. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But he did come in and he talked a little bit about um, his mission and he's really focused on education. You know, while he could spend his time going to beaches and, and you know, floating the plastics out of it, he does have a kit available to where you could actually purchase your own, you know, the, your own wagon, your own hose and all of this stuff. You can basically build your own flotation device or buoyancy flotation separation device for about $300. Um, and that's something that we're looking at, you know, purchasing one of our own, um, really getting educated from Ray and the folks over at Seed World so that we can take it around and do the same thing so we can help separate. But also um, he's really focused on the education component and especially educating um, kids. So this, this is a really awesome opportunity to take advantage once we share his info in the chat. Um, but we can check and see if the other one was recorded. I'm not 100% sure. Um, so this is just a little um, what the District 5000 was able to help come together and support sustainable coastlines, their Earth Day celebration results, you know, 818 pounds of trash removed. They had over 500 volunteers over there, thousands of pieces of microplastic, and they had some workshops. And I, I really uh, I'm thankful to have that opportunity. And, um, you know, there's a, the Windward Hui that came together. Um, Metro was over there as well. Um, so thank you to Gary Picaro was really um, pivotal in getting that happening and uh, Anke as well. So thank you all for you know contributing to these numbers that they were able to form just in one day. So our District 5000 Rotarians at Work Day 2021, we had 31 of the 53 Rotary Clubs throughout the state of Hawaii participate plus rotor actors, which are also kind of some parts of our rotary clubs. We had over 125 volunteers. Now I know that number is much higher, but these are just the numbers that I was able to collect from the 12 clubs that um, did submit the data collection. So we know that these numbers are much, much higher, but again, without collecting the data, we're only speculating. So I'm, I'm happy to say there was over 125 plus volunteers that day at 28 different locations across Hawaii. So of the 12 clubs that submitted the data collection, we had over 120, as I mentioned, over 125 volunteers. So we recorded 127 volunteers. The average amount of time was 2.33 hours. So the most amount of time spent during a cleanup on this day was three hours and the least amount of time was two hours. So again, we made tremendous impact in just a short amount of time. From those clubs, we had over 2,000 almost 3,000 pounds of rubbish removed from those locations. My internet connection says it's having trouble. Hmm. We can still hear you really well and see the slide. Yeah, but it's not progressing to the next numbers. Hmm. Let me try stop sharing and just see. Yeah, it's, it's not sharing my screen anymore, right? No. Let me try again. Here you go. Okay, there we go. The plastic bags. We had over almost 600 plastic bags cleaned up. Uh, over a thousand plastic bottle caps, 266 plastic bottles eating utensils, so that could be forks, knives, spoons, 244 of those. The styrofoam, it's another huge problem everywhere we look. The plastic food wrappers, now this one um, is a little bit higher than I was even expecting. So I'm, I'm really shocked and kind of saddened by how much 
plastic food wrappers we were finding at multiple locations, plastic straws and stirs. We really hope to see this number go down um, in the coming years because there's so many great alternatives to this, but still 379 were recorded. Cigarette butts, holy moly. Let's get these butts off of our beach. Over 3,000 cigarette butts were collected in, you know, again, just a couple of hours by just over 100 volunteers. The fishing line and fishing materials, the number is 93 because that was just for the number of pieces. But as you could see, just from the James Campbell cleanup, I mean, these are not small amounts of fishing material and lines and nets. It, it is quite staggering. Um, aluminum cans. So these are high fives, right? Bottles and cans. This is five cents each and people are letting them, you know, not get into the recycling bin or ending up in our rubbish. And the glass cans too, maybe we not all of the material was recyclable, but a good, good portion of that likely could have been recycled. Um, this is a map that John has been working on. And this is a really cool way to see what the problem is and where. Um, you, as you can see, there, there's more locations that still yet need to be added. But what he's been doing is kind of showing a little bit of like a heat map of where these items are being found and what items are being found at these locations. I think once this is um, in, and again, the more we do these Ridge Sharif cleanups, the more data we can collect, then we can see the change over time at these areas. Is it getting bigger? Is the problem getting worse? Or is the problem shrinking? So we partnered with so many different organizations and it, the list just went on and on. Sustainable Coastline, Surfrider Foundation, Ocean Defenders Alliance, Hawaii Wildlife Fund was wonderful. You know, Mal Malama Maui Nui, Hawaii Island Land and Trust, and the list goes on and on. Um, but really what we're emphasizing is it might not be my garbage, but it's my planet. Every piece of plastic made still exists and the animals don't leave trash. Humans do. Please behave like animals. Every person did just a little bit, you know, a multiple, that was kind of the, the reoccurring theme is that everybody found just a little, but you're never too small to make a difference. And I'm, I'm certain with just the 127 volunteers of the data that we recorded, knowing there was way more than that, it did make a difference. And, you know, just imagine if 7.7 .7 billion people truly believed that their actions made a difference. Cause I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be hosting beach cleanups when I'm 70 or 80 years old. I, I wanna find solutions to these problems. I don't want these problems to persist. So I'm really hopeful with the data that we collected at these locations that we're gonna be able to make meaningful projects going forward. And I just wanted to highlight some of the numbers that were really staggering to me. So James Campbell had the highest amount, over a thousand pounds of rubbish removed just from their location alone. But Sand Island, Sand Island had 390 plastic bags that far outseated every other location that submitted the data. Um, Kailua Beach Park, 479 bottle caps. Again, that was way higher than any other location that submitted this data. Plastic bottles, that headed the way um, by the Waikiki vicinity in Central Park. They had 73 plastic bottle caps over there. Um, the next location, uh, Electric Beach, led the way with plastic eating utensils, 54. So um, on the North Shore, they're creating a, a reusable container program. But I'm hopeful that maybe we can find programs to do over in these areas like Electric Beach, where they're finding so many plastic utensils. Maybe we can try to um, find a way to get more sustainable options in there. Um, is styrofoam, again, Sand Island led the way, 930 pieces over there. Plastic food wrappers, Sand Island again, 300 plus food wrappers at that location alone. Um, for the cigarette butts, I'll tell you the number, 1,252 were collected at one location. And that was over in the uh, Ke'ehi boat launch area. That's huge. The, they said this is the Eddie Pau Trail, um, a, a, just a section of that trail, over 1,000 cigarette butts in that area. What can we do to make that not be a problem anymore? Because we all know the wildlife is eating those and that kills, you know, when they try to feed that to their babies. So that, that number is quite staggering. Um, the fishing line that led the way as well, Sand Island again, um, and aluminum cans, 
same that was in um that same part of the Eddie Powell trail over there, 248 aluminum cans. And then for the glass cans, that was 304 of them. And then the city of Capole. So it's really interesting when I sit down and I look at these numbers and by location and by club. And even when I started looking at, you know, how many volunteers they had at each location and breaking it down, how much did each volunteer contribute into that location? It's phenomenal, you guys. It, it's really, really impressive to see these numbers, to get this data back, to have such a, a majority of the clubs on Oahu participated, you know, just over 100 volunteers and dozens of locations. We are so much stronger together than we are apart. And I, I really hope that um, you can hear the excitement in my, my voice. I'm, I'm really excited about the results of this project and, and how do we go forward from here. So at this point, I'll, um, I'll stop talking and I'd love to hear any feedback or experience from um, individuals on this Ridge to Reef Day at the Rotarians at Work Day 2021. Um, we are hoping to do another cleanup on July 24th, which is on a Saturday. Um, and if you guys aren't aware, July is also plastic free July. So I think it kind of speaks well to the next um, cleanup. So with that, any questions, comments from the first Ridge to Reef cleanup day? Well, I just want to thank you and credit for this wonderful presentation. Uh, that's, that's it, really, really excellent. Well, thank you, Stuart. Were you able to um, attend any one of the cleanups on the? I Rotarians wasn't able. I was. Our club did it. I was not able to make it that day, uh, but uh, cigarette butts were the big thing here <laughs> on Maui, and I know a number of clubs on Maui did it. <clears throat> and uh, I'm hoping to be able to plug in on the July one. Awesome. Yeah, Mariko was awesome on Maui and really helped organize all the clubs and all the locations. There was a huge amount of support um, from Maui out there. So thank you, Stuart, and to all the Maui clubs over there. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get back out and do it again. April, I just want to reiterate, uh, looking forward to having access or, or John to the uh, recording. I'd like to be able to share it with our club and, uh, and um, in our, I'm going to take some stills from it, perhaps put them in our newsletter and so on. Absolutely. And if, if there's photos in there that you want, I can um, send you the high res ones as well. Thank you. Um, I was thinking we have, you know, 15 minutes left and, uh, you know, with most of us are, are in the eco-ordery club uh, and we all pretty much went to different uh, different cleanups. So maybe we can just go around and talk about our experience, the cleanups that we that we went to and, uh, you know, what, what that was like, what kind of stuff they're cleaning up. Sure. Um, um, I can start, if, if anything. Um, so I was actually with Honolulu Sunset. So we were at Magic Island. Um, that was really interesting. I found a lot of fishing line. I found a lot of food wrappers. I was surprised at the amount of foam that I saw. Um, just assuming that everybody's barbecuing out there and um, that stuff's kind of floating into the water. So I was not on the beach part, but right by the docks where it slopes down and it's like all the rocks where people kind of go fishing. So I was over there. So yeah, a lot of fishing line, um, but it was cool. I, I was really appreciative to have the opportunity to meet new faces. Um, so that was awesome. Naomi, I met your son, Ryan. So <laughs> we, we were uh, going around and I was like, wait, Naomi's Ryan he's like yep <laughs> so yeah it was it was awesome just seeing a bunch of new faces so um it was really great and you know hoping to have more and the opportunity to go around um to join other rotary clubs as well so thank you and thank you April for this whole thing it was really amazing Kara, you are awesome it's April's April project 
April's April <laughs> project. <laughs> yes, and I'm I'm happy to make it an annual April's <laughs> April project. Hey, Brand. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll talk about my experience. I, I went to two cleanups that day. Um, one was uh, Kailua Beach Park with uh, the E-Club, Rotary E-Club. And that was a, a small cleanup. Um, just a few people going along the beach um, with buckets and, and picking up stuff. Uh, most of what I found there was uh, just microplastics. And they didn't, we didn't have any sifters or anything. So um, you know, I think they continued on for a while, but I, I had to leave and go to the Waimanalo uh, Sherwood Forest Park, uh, beach park with um, uh, sustainable coastlines. And that was, that was a different experience. I'd never been to a beach cleanup that, that large. And, um, you know, they had uh, a bunch of tents, tents set up where, you know, people could, uh, you know, do plastic based, ocean based, trash based trivia and win little prizes. Um, they had stations where people can come get, you know, bags if they want to pick up larger stuff or sifters if they want to just hang out on the on the beach, sit down and sift through some sand. Um, that's why I ended up doing and, uh, you know, met some pretty cool people there. And um, yeah, a lot of them hadn't heard of Rotary. They were there, you know, because we had so many organizations that were, were working there. It just brought in a lot of a lot of people who just wanted to help out. Um, yeah, and they did have that that giant uh, ro rotating sifter, which is cool to watch. But um, yeah, he could literally just sit in one spot for an hour and just sifting through the sand just in your immediate vicinity and you'd, you'd still find tons of, of little pieces of microplastics. So that was interesting to see. You bring up such a good point, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, it's painstakingly long process to get those microplastics out. So we have to find a way to stop putting them in and yep. stop creating so much virgin plastic and find alternatives. And um, yeah, like you said, you can sit in one spot all day and just sort out the microplastics. It's, I think it's safe to say it is impossible to get rid of all the plastic properly that's been produced, but there's no reason we shouldn't try. And th there's definitely options available out there. And thank you, Jacob, for going to two different locations on that day um, and, and sharing your story and sharing the work of Rotary with other folks who may not have otherwise heard of us or known about us. And this is what it's all about, is creating the awareness of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how they can join us. Yeah. Also, their data, their data collection setup was incredible. They just had big tarp out. They had a bunch of volunteers out helping people sort through things, a uh, bunch of, bunch of uh, uh, garbage bins for the bottles and the glass and all these other things. And, um, you know, a table where people can go in and like report their microplastic collection. So um, I think there's a lot that we can learn from how they manage that whole process as well. Yes, absolutely. These guys are the professionals. They've been doing this a long time and they're really perfecting the process. Um, I was really thankful to um, have them on as guest speakers for the data collection uh, meeting that we had leading up to this event to try to prepare everybody and, you know, to maybe ask some questions that anybody would have leading up to it. But you can't believe it until you see it. It is such a massive operation and they're so organized and it's so well done. And yeah, we are lucky enough to be able to partner with them and learn from them and then share what we've learned with within Rotary. Absolutely. Um, uh, what about John? Yeah, I did. Uh, it wasn't with the Rotarian group. I did it with my um, the company I work with, WATG. Um, and we had about maybe like six or seven people. Um, I think one of them signed the waiver. So it was like, it's hard to get people like actually involved. Um, but yeah, it was, it went very smoothly. We did it at Sandy's um, and I expected to find a lot of stuff. And actually it was, it was quite clean. I was surprised. Um, and it generally fit in with a lot of data I've seen where it's like mostly cigarette butts and bottle caps 
and like plastic bags seem to be the the main the main uh, garbage out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was generally generally went fairly smooth. I mean, one of the things though that I was starting to maybe question was like when I when I was putting this together, it felt a lot like the locations that I was putting forth to like as options for people to go to. Um, there was a bit of a sense of like entertainment involved. Like it wasn't like, even though there's gonna be areas within Honolulu that I know there's a lot of garbage and maybe a lot of problems. It's like, I, I felt like it was gonna be really hard to get people to go there and motivated. Or if it was like, if I was gonna go and do a trail somewhere um, some people may not have been able to do it. And it's just one of those things that I started to wonder is like, how do we get more projects in the urban areas and particularly on land? Because I think a lot of our, a lot of the groups went right to the beach and it was very, it became very much a beach cleanup, which is kind of like a big part of it. But I think what April you were also trying to get at was like, how do we do Ridge to Re? And the Ridge part seemed like it was, it was a bit, um, I don't know, out of, the, out of the picture. And there's more maybe. opportunity for it. Let's say that, right? Like, there's some yeah. hiking trails, um, but we we did have some, you know, good support on the land. You know, especially with Christina and Lori's the, the Pearl Harbor Historic Trail um, in Kapolei. Um, they did some cleanup around the city of Kapolei, um, Centennial Park downtown. So yeah, there, like you said, the location is key. And I think this was also a, a really good indication of seeing what locations maybe didn't need a lot of help and a few locations that, wow, we could really send more people out there. If, if this is what, you know, the eight people that went out there and accomplished, what could we do with 25 people? So yeah, the, the so kind of like segueing into like what we've learned is really identifying the locations where us Rotarians can do the most good and where the help is most needed. Um, things that we've learned is trying to make everything digital and easy as possible. Um, we did the waiver digitally, we did the data collection digitally, and I would love to do the sign up digitally going forward and have the locations pre-designed. And uh, hopefully as these COVID restrictions loosen, we'll be able to get more individuals at the locations that really need it. Um, but yeah, um, I, I want to give another special shout out to Naomi. She was amazing through this whole process, so supportive. We spent so much time on the phone planning and thinking all of these things out and, you know, really working through the, the challenges that came up along the way. You know, every island was not the same. Um, Maui still had restrictions of only five individuals of gathering. So we, we, we had to try to you know, think through a lot of different options and try to find meaningful work for people to do that they would be interested in doing and uh, really coming together. So really, and then being the star of the show, you know, getting on camera, you know, um, there was a really great support um, from the media and I, I'm just so thankful for the opportunity. So thank you to Naomi for supporting this project and putting the word out there to the district and making it happen. It would not have happened without you helping and pushing me along the way. I really am thankful. No, thanks. But you know, April, it was your idea and I was just there to support you. And it starts with that idea. And one person says, we can do this and it happens. Hey, but I want to ask you guys, have you been on the Hoova? There's an um, environment focus group. And there were 17 people who went there and somebody's following it. So I, I suggest somebody going in there and April, put in your comments. If you have an um, event in July, put that in there um, and get um, whoever has got the group email, get those names that are in this um, app and add them to your email list. And that's, you said it's a group conversation, not, not the House of Friendship? It's in the House of Friendship. Oh, no, no, it's not. It's in the community, the community tab. Okay, I'll check that out because I tried to put some info in the in our House of Friendship, letting them know we'd be kind of going over the, the project today and to join us. So yeah, I'll check that. I'll try to look into the community on the app. 
for, for anybody who doesn't know, the district conference was this weekend too, and um, really delighted that our Rotary Club was mentioned. Um, and I and you know again with this Ridge to Reef, I want our club to be the contact for how to do it, how to be eco, how to be sustainable. You know, and if our club members, which we have some amazing members, if we don't have the answers, we probably have the network of connections to find the person who does. Um, and really how to take action. And our, our club is such a, such a great resource that I want to help um, lead the way for other clubs to do environmentally friendly projects and to, you know, do zero waste events. I, I love consulting on stuff like that. So, um, you know, just really wanting to make sure that everybody knows that they can reach out to the Eco Club for help and for ideas or inspiration, because we have a really awesome club. I brag about my Eco Rotary Club all the time, um, and I encourage people to join us. But since we're all Rotarians on this call, I don't want to <laughs> steal club members away from their club. But yeah, our, our club is pretty great. Um, I did want to hear if we could real quick from Talon. Um, he was out at the James Campbell, which um, real quickly what I did was I started my morning at James Campbell and I uh, just wanted to see that location because I had been dying to get out there. It's considered the dirtiest beach on island. I progressed from there and those 12 individuals, they've got off to the great start. I went to the Mokalaia Beach cleanup, which was um, led by Kate Butts and the Wahiwa Waialua Rotary Club, which multiple other Rotary Clubs came out, Interact Clubs came out. It was a huge showing of support over there. Really, really great turnout. And then I made my way down to the Alamoana Magic Island um, beach and the reef cleanup. Um, so those were the three locations I got to go to, but um, I wanted to hear from Talent, and I see um, Christina has her hand up too. Sure. Um, this was my first beach cleanup. So, you know, I had a really good time. I think I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't part of Eco Rotary because I'm the type of guy that I need a fire lit under me to be able to go out and do something. So I really appreciate April just really spearheading this and just taking the lead on this. I think I repeat what she said. I think we have a really great club. And I think, um, yeah, we just, we have so much more to do. And the thing about the beach cleanup, even after three hours, there was still rubbish on the beach, but you know, our three hours was up and we had to go home. And so, I know this isn't going to be my last beach cleanup. I know I just started my eco journey and I'm just really happy and honored to be starting that journey with all you guys. So yeah, you know, there's so much more to go. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Talon. Your efforts are really appreciated. And Christina put in a ton of effort wrangling all these folks in different organizations and Hawaii Bicycling League. Um, Christina, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about the Pearl Harbor Historic Trail. Yeah, um, I, there's not, there's so much to say about how it was organized and put together. Um, and it seems like we had so many people helping and it's like, oh, we had like over 300, but um, there is a link of a video that I put in the chat it was done by somebody, I mean, I was sent it from a Rotarian because he's part of uh, a bike group and then they went back a week later. So they kind of showed us doing the cleanup and some of my photos and stuff, but then they also showed like how bad it looked <laughs> like a week later still because so much was not picked up. So even though we had like 8.6 tons of trash and like four point, I think nine or eight, um, tons of metal waste and then like 75 tires and we weren't even able to get out any of the cars at this point which which there's probably a couple dozen cars um, that is all still there there's so much stuff still there that the city didn't get out and it's on navy land and so there's there's so much more to be done um, anyways <laughs> it's 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 a big initiative so that's why I think We'll definitely want to partner um, and get them to do this quarterly one with us, but then they'll probably have adopters that will hopefully tend to the over five mile path, I would say, hopefully monthly instead of, you know, twice a year, which is what they try to do. 
I wonder if there's ways we can start to propose like self-sustaining initiatives. I, like I remember like April was like mentioning like if there's a lot of cigarette butts, we could put those like cigarette garbage cans or something. Um, I don't know, just to see somehow what we're finding, like the end, the end goal of this project is like to come up with maybe political initiatives or something like that. If you want, you could play it, but I didn't know. Maybe, maybe designing some large, uh, attractive, beachside, giant uh, ashtrays. <laughs> <laughs> you know what really like works movie? for those, and it's kind of an odd thing. But have you ever been to like a coffee shop and they have two tip jars, right? Oh, which is your favorite character from Friends? You know, Russell or you know Rachel or you know like you get to vote Rachel or Monica, you know, you get to use your cigarette butts to place a vote. You know, it, it, it's a silly thing, but it actually encourages people to be responsible because they feel like it means something rather than it just going on the ground. But, you know, just creative ways like that to engage people to do the right thing. Right on. Nudging people with fun gamification. Yeah, I wonder some if little nudge. Like, it would be interesting to see, um, God, I don't know who would do this. I guess I would have to do it. But like, to see how many garbage bins there are, like Very at these locations. You know, if, that's, if there's like a correlation between like excessive amount of garbage and little garbage bins or something like that. You do bring up a good point is the accessibility and what you see a, more of is the garbage bins, but what you don't see is a place for people to put bottles and cans. So like on the main line, it was yeah. really common to have a rubbish container and then kind of piggybacked on the side of it would be a mesh wire basket that you could put bottles and cans in. I, I see that there are individuals that will go ahead and pull items out of the garbage right? They're, they're pulling the bottles and cans out, sifting through food waste and God knows what else. But if we just had that secondary alternative to not throw your high fives into the landfill and make it easier for somebody to come and collect them, because I promise you they will, you know, but not, you know, demoralizing them to having them having to collect or go through our garbage to get something that we should have been recycling all along. But the problem is there aren't recycling receptacles readily available at many locations so I, I think that that's another area you know looking at the bottles and cans that were collected at these locations I highly doubt there are any recycling receptacles you don't see them walking the city streets of Waikiki you don't really see them in any city around here there's there's not recy recycling isn't readily available so I'm hopeful that we can try to make um, projects and campaigns to help eliminate some of these issues on on Maui, we at the parks they have three part uh, containers for recycling, but I don't think there are any right at the beaches. Has uh, anybody been to a, a park in Osaka, Japan, by the Osaka <laughs> Castle? There are no rubbish cans, and there's no rubbish. Everybody takes the rubbish home. Yes, yes I know this. <laughs> <laughs> that's the solution but let's make it how can we make that happen yeah it's cultural behavioral um that's definitely true so uh i went to a solid waste management plan public meeting um public hearing it's before covid so it must have been over a year ago um but yeah they had nothing in there about uh trash at the beaches or waste receptacles at the beaches. And the reason for that is because it's not the city and county that's responsible for it. It's actually, this, I think, the state parks. Um, it was responsible for uh, for management at the beaches. So I think the lack of integration um, of, you know, these, these different disparate parts and the bureaucracy around it, that's something that needs to change. It needs to be reorganized for is, who's is responsible there for it. Is there any um, reach out to legislators at all to implement these kinds of things at beaches? I think it would have to be on the state level, like Jacob was saying, 
But I mean, just going to different countries when I was in Europe, there's so much um, like in Europe in all different countries and how they have their recycling, you know, containers and stuff everywhere. It's pretty, yeah, I mean, people, the other countries are doing it. So there's definitely a model that we can adopt if people are willing to put money towards it. Yeah. My, ta my take is that if, <clears throat> if the um, environmentalists in Rotary uh, even put together some kind of proposal um, the, for, leg for the state legislature and encouraged uh, people to write letters to their legislators to promote that, there could be something implemented perhaps at the state level. Yeah, and I, I do want to use this SRAG, this focus on the, you know, uh, this, this action group to really focus on, you know, what do we want to do as a district um, for people who are interested in the environment to get involved in, in political action. So yeah, that's definitely something I want to explore. Absolutely. And it is, it's about that accountability too, like Christina was saying in other countries, um, there, there's a different sense of sorting out what is rubbish, what is compost, what is recyclable. And we have a lot of, as we heard from Henry Gabriel, a lot of wish cycling here where people wish it was recyclable, but it's not. And then it ends up contaminating mm -hmm. the rest of the material. Um, they see it at Hawaiian Earth Products where plastic is getting tossed into with the green waste, even like one plastic bag. And uh, it really is causing troubles all over the place. You know, the only items recycled here on Oahu is one and two. Now, if you don't know, there's seven different options of plastic, seven different markers and only one and two, but we're not even recycling that properly. So there, there's such a I think there's an opportunity is what I like to say when there's a problem, but there's a definitely a problem around the way the campaigning is done for recycling and the, the way that we don't have an option for food waste. Um, I may have been at that same meeting, Jacob, you were talking about for the solid waste management plan over the next 10 years, and there was mm. nothing for food waste, which we waste about a third of the food that we bring into this island, and it's not being put into compost. It's not being fed to, you know, pigs it's literally going to the landfill or the incinerator, which is a crime. It's a resource. It's not waste. It should be diverted into areas where it can be seen as a resource and put back into the soil. Our soil is in desperate need of better, you know, as we learned from EM Hawaii, we, we need effective microorganisms in the soil for plants to grow. And we're seeing that up at um, Gunstock Ranch with our tree planting. We are having to supplement the fertilization because the soil is just not rich anymore and how great would that be if we could do it with compost if there were facilities and options available for folks people want to do the right thing we just got to give them the access to it i had a question i didn't know i was going to look into this but now with all the um this is a little off topic but with all of the um the styrofoam and the plastics and the stuff where that there's not they're not supposed to be using for our two goes um i just see a whole bunch of styrofoam boxes that are coming out of like panda express or anything like that i was just curious do we know do we have any updates on those things i need to like follow up <laughs> so it was initially put into effect in december of 2019 um at that time there was a lot of massive pushback from um uh, you know uh, certain organizations, especially some big businesses, that it was going to be unaffordable. It was going to put people out of business. So they they pushed it back to 2020. Um, and then because of COVID, they pushed it back again to April 1st of this year. Um, so it is still pretty new. And that was supposed to give folks more than enough time to use the stock that they already had, the inventory that they already had on hand, and to make plans for resources to substitute and better alternatives going forward. Um, from the research and information that I've found, the folks that have made the switch are saving money. You know, in the beginning, it might cost you more per container, but they're not giving out those containers anymore. They are supposed to ask you, do you need utensils? Do you need napkins? And if you can, you can supply your own bag, but you know, it's, it's this behavioral thing and it's hard to make a habit they say it takes seven weeks. So we're, you know, just coming up on the cusp of that right now. Um, 
I'm hopeful that in time, and especially with the pilot of the reusable container program up here on the North Shore, that we're going to see more things like that available. These things worked in the past, and there's no reason that they can't work again. The milkman, right, given your empty bottles outside of your door and you'd have full ones the next day, those, those things worked, and there's no reason to have gotten rid of them. You know, you think there's so many options for reusing rather than making single use waste. Uh, but as far as that, you know, the Bill 40 and those, the policies go, it's still pretty new. It, it really just came into effect recently. So I'm sure there are businesses that are not abiding by the new, new laws, um, but hopefully more and more are coming on board as the community pressures them. You know, I, I'm, I'll be the first one to say like, no, thank you. I don't need the cutlery. I have my own when they try to give it to you without asking if you need it. Yeah. Well, I was just curious. Um, I was wondering if there's any, like, if there's anything that would actually happen if they don't follow the rules. Like I didn't know, do they have fines? I didn't know any of that. If there's any way to like, cause that's kind of like the next step, right? If, if nobody's going to follow it, even though it's a law, it's just like um, anything else, if there's no actual like reprimanding for them. <laughs> Yeah, without without enforcement, it means not much. And I know, um, speaking from my experience at Habitat for Humanity Restore with the plastic bag ban, um, there were repercussions that they they did state clearly. You know, if you're found in violation of this, you know, you have to charge people for the bags plus the GE tax. So there were um, clear and defined, um, you know, corrections, so to speak, for behavior that wasn't following the rules. But as far as Bill 40, I'm not certain on those. If anybody else has any better understanding of those, if not, maybe we can get a speaker about it. Yeah, I'll look into it. Okay, cool. I've definitely experienced a shift with, you know, being asked with if I, if I need a straw instead of just handing it to me or um, utensils and stuff as well. I don't know if anyone else has seen that, but Oh, it's funny. I did find like those reusable straws on the beach, which I was like, okay, like, these are good straws, but they're still like kind of polluting the beach. I guess it's better. Yeah, I guess fish could eat those straws or something. It's okay. I don't know. What kind of, were they glass or metal reusable straws, John? No, they were the paper. The paper oh, straws. so they're, they're going to biodegrade, yeah? Yeah. Which actually is maybe is a good sign because it's like finding those like well, it would have probably been a, a plastic straw before that. So behavior is like, not gonna change overnight, but yeah, exactly. Like it still takes I change without having people change their behavior. That's gonna be more impactful than trying to convince everyone to change. Little baby steps, one thing at a time. I mean, that, yeah. like, that's the reality is like within our culture is like, there's definitely a good part of our population and it's just probably not going to. Yeah, you know, so you affect the infrastructure around it. Yeah. It doesn't damage. Yeah. All right. 7.15. I just want to put in uh, I just want to put in one plug for my pet project which is trying to get Rotary International to divest of fossil fuel investments and anybody yes. who wants to pitch in with me on that uh, has ideas or wants to do legwork or anything please let me know. Yeah, so we're talking about that and potentially I was thinking maybe using uh, maybe having it be a theme or a quarter or something. Um, where all the SRI meetings are focused around that. You know, first time we have maybe a, a speaker come in and talk about divestment. Um, maybe the next time we can have more of a workshop uh, where we, you know, work together as Rotarians to come up with, with solutions or a campaign um, around divestment. Um, if that's something that everybody's interested in, then yeah, I think it's a, it's a great thing to focus on. Is this SRAG in con connection, in communication with the other SRAGs around the world, essentially? Not at the moment. Because that would be, be that would be but... the kind of pressure that would be the kind of pressure that would make a difference, I think. Yeah. 
I, yeah, I think we absolutely have the potential once we kind of get our bearings and see as a club, you know, not even just our Rotary Club, but the s Club, like what we want to do, what we want to accomplish. And I think that's a really meaningful thing, Stuart. And I always say the most, uh, you know, democratic thing you can do is to vote with your dollar. Because that's really going to make the difference. These companies aren't going to change unless it makes dollars and cents. As long as capitalism rules, we need to um, find ways to work within that system and encourage good behavior. And the best way to encourage good is to vote with your dollar for the people you believe in. Right. That's that's on the kind of person by person basis. But I mean, there are universities that are divesting. It's really becoming a thing, an ethical, an ethical movement essentially. And um, if Rotary doesn't set the example, I mean, for is it beneficial for all concerned and so on, then I think we're missing the mark. So I think Rotary, it just seems like a natural thing for Rotary to do. Yeah, I think one thing we we need to understand how Rotary is invested in, in the first place. Is it you know, international foundation, district foundations? Um, well, at the at the at the international level, it, it it's that's where the big investing is for the funding that that feeds all the grants that come back uh, in three years to every club. And uh, <clears throat> the details of, I've tried to investigate the details of those investments and you can only get so far <clears throat> and then they just say it's invested in such and such a fund or, yeah. so that's, that's part of the research obviously. Yeah. yeah. So Stuart, I did um, send a message to Brenda Cressy. She's a trustee on the foundation board. Um, I did not get a response, but um, Ed Futa is a speaker on Thursday at the Honolulu Sunset Club, if you want to ask him a question, because he was the um, general secretary and COO. He's been gone a while, but he might know who to contact. And uh, is that going to be an, an online meeting? Yes, it's on Zoom. Um, how do I get the login for that? I think it's on their website, but I, I'll send it to you, Stuart. It's the Honolulu Sunset. Honolulu Sunset, Sunset, Sunset six thirty on Thursday. Oh, I could make that. I think. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so April, I'm gonna um, create a, a page for you in the House of Friendship, so you can um, put some. If you can convert, put all the pictures on a PowerPoint and convert it to PDF, then you can upload all the pictures and then you can put one video. So what video would you like to put up there? I mean, gosh, I, I mean, for the House of Friendship, I added a bunch of pictures to our uh, Eco Rotary Club one, but for the video, I, I mean, the Hilo Club, they did the East, or I'm sorry, the South Hilo Club, right? Their video was phenomenal. I, I really think they hit the nail on the head with that. Yeah, but they already posted theirs to their booth. <laughs> I, oh, okay. I, I think, and I think Wahiwab did their own. So anyway, um, I'll send you the link and you can put more stuff on that page. Okay. And this will be for like a District 5000 or? No, the Hoover House of Friendship. So in addition to the Eco Rotary Club one? Because right. we have two of them, right? One for the right. tree planting, one for the We're club, and we'll do, do a third? For, one for Ridge to Reef. Okay, you got it. And the information is up at least for two weeks after the um, conference, right? Well, we have we told everybody to the end of July, but now people are thinking it's going to be six months. So it might be six months. Oh, okay. Even better. Then it'll make make it through our next Ridge to Reef. Perfect. Yep. yep. And congratulations to the Eco Club for being um, Club of the Year. Oh, uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah for for those who missed it our our club um we we <laughs> i don't want to say we cleaned house but we definitely had a really really um for our small but mighty club and again i always say that our club is full of awesome people that make this stuff possible so you guys have all been a part of that from the tree planting to the beach cleanups to the ridge to reef to the you know kawahiki village tree plantings and mask distributions and you know, making food for the homeless shelters and encampments, you know, after COVID, all of these little projects that we do together in a, in a year with COVID-19, um, we, we, we did an amazing amount of work. So thank you to Peely 
who's not on this call today, but she, she definitely spearheaded so many of those projects and did so much work and sent out all the reminders to us. And she's just so good about organizing. Okay, I think we're, <laughs> I think it's the end. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, okay. everyone. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank night. Thank you, April. Thank you, guys. Aloha. Hey, Stuart, yeah. are you Stuart Carlin 1, Gmail? That, that's me. You got me, Naomi. Okay. <laughs> Coming over now. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, okay guys. Thank you. Oh, and April, is it, is there some way I could get a little more information about the Eco Club, uh, like how many members you have and when you meet regularly, or if you're currently, I think we have eighteen members, and we meet on Tuesdays at six o'clock, and then we dedicate this third Tuesday of each month to the SRAG meeting, and we have a guest speaker on the first Tuesday of each month. Is there any way I could, uh, do you have, put out a notice? Could I get on your email list or something like that? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, whoever is the webmaster can put him on as a, um, a subscriber or other user when you send out emails. Hey, Stuart, you know, um, one of the ideas is to have an eco um, con point of contact in every club so that every club can... I raised so my if, hand. <laughs> yeah, but if you get started on, on Maui, but um, you know, if you want to do a um eco e club on Maui, you know, that may, might be a good thing. Well, if I if we could get a uh, eco representative in each club, <clears throat> that group could come together at least, and maybe there are other club members who'd want to join for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, more homework. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, done talk. Yeah. <laughs> That's when you, I have this is I have this Doctor Strange love kind of raising my hand <laughs> thing. I have to control it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, um, guys. John, don't forget to stop the recording, John. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. And and speaking yeah. of which, will you will you share the uh, link to the recording with us? And and do you have my email address to do that with? <sighs> Did you get the email to join this meeting? I got it. Let me just see how I, <clears throat> I, I put it in my calendar, so I'm not quite sure where I got it from oh. originally. Um, why don't you, can you write your email in the chat and then I can just add you to the list. Okay, you got it. Let me just jump in and do that. Yeah, actually I gotta figure out how to get the recording. Right at the bottom, it'll say stop, pause or stop. Yeah.